For the purposes of this lecture, we will look at the Federal Judiciary Building, which has occurred in the modern air. This is the fourth of a four-part series deconstructing Justin Crow's book, Building the Judiciary. Modern America is typically referred to by most historians as occurring between 1939 to 2000. We will specifically examine judicial institution building from the start of World War II to the election of President George W. Bush in 2000. In modern America, legislators, judges, and academics worked to enhance the power of the judiciary. Often this was done on a bipartisan basis and these reforms tended to be uncontroversial. Let us first examine the judiciary in the 1940s. For much of this decade, we know that building of the federal judiciary more or less took a back seat to more pressing matters. During and after World War II, we know that America became a major world power. With this power came enormous responsibilities. And when Japan refused to withdraw from the war, the United States in 1945 deployed two nuclear weapons on the Japanese cities of Hiroshima in Nagasaki. Six days after the bombing of Nagasaki, Japan announced its surrender to the Allies, signing the instrument of surrender on the 2nd of September, officially ending World War II. In the aftermath of World War II, the United States would begin to experience conflicts with the Soviet Union, which had been an ally in both World War I and II. In the years to come, tensions with the Soviet Union, coupled with the fervor of the 1960s, would give rise to a national security state. This would ultimately have an influence on the judiciary. For now, let us look at the impact that Earl Warren would have on the U.S. Supreme Court. Eight years after World War II, former California Governor Cal Earl Warren would become the 14th U.S. Supreme Court Justice in October of 1953. Under the leadership of Chief Justice Warren, the court would adopt a more aggressive role as it advanced a more progressive constitutional vision. One year after Earl Warren became Chief Justice, the court in the landmark case Brown versus the Board of Education declared state laws establishing separate public schools for African American and white students to be unconstitutional. This decision was unanimous and it held that separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. Interestingly, Chief Justice Warren had to convince two of his fellow Supreme Court justices to drop their dissents. Warren drafted the basic opinion and kept circulating and revising it until he had an opinion endorsed by all of the members of the court. The final decision was unanimous, but it took quite a bit of work on the part of Chief Justice Warren to make this a unanimous decision. Brown versus the Board of Education has been described by most legal scholars as being a textbook example of judicial activism. Judicial activism describes judicial rulings which are suspected of being based on personal or political considerations rather than on existing law. When the court declared that separate but equal facilities were unconstitutional, state and federal legislators were still not willing to integrate school systems. And believe it or not, public opinion was also against this. So this mandate came from the court. And for many years, state governments still tried to avoid integrating schools and universities, even in spite of this landmark piece of legislation. In many cases, federal marshals were called in to force local officials to allow minority students into public schools. This struggle went on well into the 1960s. For example, in 1963, Governor George Wallace of Alabama 
refused to allow African American students into the University of Alabama. President John F. Kennedy had to order federal marshals into the school to forcibly allow the students to register. Here, the executive branch was working to preserve a ruling by the federal judiciary. The, unanim the unanimity that Warren achieved helped to speed the drive to desegregate public schools, which mostly came about under the very conservative president, Richard Nixon. Throughout his years as Chief Justice, Earl Warren succeeded in keeping all decisions concerning segregation unanimous. The board, the, excuse me, the Brown decision of 1954 marked in dramatic fashion the radical shift in the courts and the nation's priorities from issues of property rights to civil liberties. And it is important to note that the court was much more progressive than Congress. Congress would wait a decade after Brown versus the Board of Education to pass civil rights legislation, such as the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So when it came to civil rights, the court was ahead of public opinion as well um, as both the executive and legislative branch of government. On the left, you see a picture, of course, of John F. Kennedy, and some scholars have argued that the legislation that Congress passed a year and two years after his death was in some fashion a tribute to the late JFK. This legislation probably would have been passed anyway, though. Earl Warren was a more liberal justice than anyone had ever anticipated. Besides Brown versus the Board of Education, the Warren Court made numerous other decisions which were applauded by civil rights activists. In the realm of criminal justice, the Warren Court unanimously ruled in Gideon v. Wainwright that state courts are required under the 14th Amendment to provide counsel in criminal cases for defendants who are unable to afford to pay their own attorneys. And three years later, in a 5-4 to four decision known as Miranda v. Arizona, the court held that both incriminating statements made in response to interrogation by a defendant in police custody would only be admissible in trial only if the prosecution could show that the defendant was informed of the right to counsel with an attorney before and during the questioning and of the right against self-incrimination prior to questioning. These key rulings have dramatically changed the day-to-day -day operations of law enforcement within the United States. Warren would lead the court throughout the turbulent 1960s, which marked a period of liberal restlessness, which would manifest in protests and demonstrations from Berkeley, California to Washington, D.C. During this 1960s period, young activists embraced a counterculture of ideas about sex, drugs, and identity politics. In 1968, Congress approved a law titled the Federal Magistrates Act, which was signed by President Lyndon B. Johnson that created the position of federal magistrate judge. The position replaced United States commissioners. Congress would continue to tinker with this law over the years, eventually allowing magistrates to conduct pretrial hearings as well as civil trials with or without juries so long as both parties consented. Federal magistrates were also given the power to accept plea bargains and impose sentences in misdemeanor cases and reside over probation revocation hearings, among other duties. Congress also expanded the classes of cases that magistrates would hear in later years. Basically, federal magistrates helped to clear up the dockets of district court federal judges. Because of federal magistrates, judges now had more time to, to devote to more important matters. In 1978, President Jimmy Carter signed the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act 
which established two federal courts charged solely with authorizing government responses for electronic surveillance of American citizens suspected to be agents of foreign power. This act was in part a response to President Richard Nixon's usage of federal resources to spy on political and activist groups, which violates the Fourth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. The Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act of 1972 was created to provide judicial and congressional oversight of the government's covert surveillance activities of foreign entities and individuals in the United States while maintaining the secrecy needed to protect national security. It allowed surveillance without court order within the United States for up to one year unless the surveillance would acquire the contents of any communication to which a United States person is party. If a United States person is involved, judicial authorization was required within 72 hours after the surveillance began. What is fascinating is that the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act created a court which meets in secret and approves or denies requests for such warrants. Only the number of warrants applied for and those that are issued and denied is reported. In 1980, the first year after its inception, it was this newly created court that approved 322 warrants. This number has steadily grown over the years. In the period between 1979 to 2006, a total of 25,000 applications for warrants were made to the court and only nine of these were definitively rejected and not a single request was denied until 2003. So, one might safely observe that the, that the Special Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court protected Americans only from the most egregious and unethical types of intelligence gathering behavior. What is even more alarming is that since the 9-11 attacks followed by the War on Terrorism, Congress passed legislation that has broadened the scope of allowable governmental action and it has also limited the work of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court in overseeing intelligence gathering. So we conclude our discussion of judiciary building by pointing to the relatively recent addition of two national security oriented courts in 1978. The creation of the Federal Intelligence Surveillance Court granted the government with intelligence gathering powers while placating civil libertarians by giving the appearance of judicial oversight. Over the last four weeks, we have examined the manner by which the federal judiciary has gained enormous independence, autonomy, and power since its creation. Do you think that the founding fathers of this country could have ever imagined that the American judiciary would become such a powerful institution today? Bear in mind that in 2000, the United States Supreme Court would basically decide the outcome of a presidential election in the landmark case Bush versus Gore, which is without question one of the most significant examples of judicial activism that has occurred in modern America. If you recall from the beginning of our four-week journey, the Constitution of the United States makes very little reference to the judiciary. Article 3 is quite succinct and comprises less than one-tenth of the Constitution. Even though the judiciary has grown incrementally, it is still a very powerful force to be reckoned with. As you reflect upon the material for all four weeks, think about what the Founding Fathers and framers of the Constitution might have to say about today's federal judiciary.